we have a 15-year-old in our house, a girl. I asked her about this story. That's about where Mary was when this story took place. Middle teens. I said, Lauren, what would you do if an angel came and said, you were going to have a baby? And she said, I'd kick it and run. (laughs) And as her father, I said, good move. (laughs) Smart. I'm not at all convinced that this story is the completely accurate portrayal of Mary's response. Because having this baby in and of itself is hard to imagine, it's hard to believe. She even says so. How can this be? She's perplexed and pondering. How can this possibly be? Elizabeth might have said the same thing. She was on the other end of childbearing age. How can this be? She might have said also. I also wonder if in her mind she thought to herself, how am I going to tell my parents? Are they going to believe this story? What am I going to tell Joseph? Who, by the way, we've been arranged to be married and now this and he, well, you get the rest of the picture. How am I going to tell the whole community? How am I going to walk around in Nazareth without shame, without embarrassment, without people thinking they could either legally or religiously legally do all sorts of nasty things to me? Because I've broken all sorts of covenants. I've crossed all sorts of boundaries now. I can't imagine that this story fills out the complete reaction that Mary might have had. And she certainly didn't anticipate or expect what this boy would grow up to. It's one thing to say, oh, he'll be a king, he'll be very important, it'll be wonderful. And what mom doesn't want her son to be important? (laughs) But she didn't know. She didn't know that she'd have to ride a donkey to the delivery suite. (laughs) She didn't know that this boy would be a little bit precocious. She didn't know that she'd have to take off with Joseph to Egypt because the king was trying to kill all the firstborn boys. She didn't know that this boy would say to her, Mother, I don't want to turn water into wine. She didn't know he would one day say, who is my mother? Who is my brother? She didn't know that one day she'd have to stand at the foot of the cross and see her baby boy executed by the powers that be. Had she known those things, she might have kicked the angel and run. And I don't think we'd blame her for a moment. But more on Mary in a minute. It's Christmas movie time. Who's seen a Christmas story already? You'll shoot your eye out. (laughs) Right? Christmas story, Miracle on 34th Street. Lots of Christmas movies. But it doesn't measure up to the king of them all. It's a wonderful life. Most of you know that movie, Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, one of the Barrymores. There's a scene in that movie which is oft forgotten because there's so much that that happens. It really is in many ways a kind of religious tale 
as opposed to anything else. But there's a scene in that movie where, you know, George Bailey, he runs this building and loan that he took over from his father. And <clears throat> there's some question about the solvency of the building and loan. So there's a run on the, on the bank. You know, there's, there, everybody starts, you know, crowding in and saying, I want my money. I want my money. Because they're worried that if the building and loan goes bad, and we, we, we saw this about 10 years ago when the savings and loans started going bad, that they'd be left with nothing. So they all crowd into this small office, and there's George Bailey and his, his, his uncle, and, and George is sweating it. And he's trying to convince all the people, no, 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 just, just leave your money here. It's going to be okay. We're going to work this out. You've got to trust me. We're going to be fine. One of the people just, uh, uh, you know, he demands every cent that he has. I have to have it now. And George says, are you sure? He says, no, I want it right now. So George, fine, you know, counts out the money to him. Another person says, oh, you know, I, I, I don't need it all, but I, I need some. And, oh, you know, George is, again, really, really sweating. He's, he's worried. And then a, a, a lady comes up. She's very meek and she's very mild. She comes up and she says, Something like, could I, have, could I have $6? And George says, bless you, and he kisses her on the forehead because <laughs> that's all she wanted. And somebody comes up to him during that whole thing and also says, where's my money? And George, exasperated, exasperated, he says, look, it's not here. Of course, everybody's like, what? What do you mean it's not here? He says, no, it's in, it's in your house. And it's in your house. And it's in your house. The money that you paid in doesn't stay here, but it goes out into the community. You know, remember when you, you, know, you needed a little bit of extra help? That's where the money went. Your neighbor's money, that's where it went. And he said, so I don't have it right here, literally in, in dollar bills. But all you have to do is look into our community and you'll see your money at work. Now, that's cold comfort for many of the people. But it's important that George says that because, of course, as you follow the whole arc of the movie, you realize that that's one of the central themes. That it's not just about the individuals, but it's about how that building and loan over the years, even though it was a big, rich, powerful bank, that building and loan over the years, slowly but surely, built Bedford Falls into the community that it, that it is and that it was. We find out later in the movie that George's generosity, his, his, his way of being really, uh, pays off, literally, and, and figuratively, but for those of you who don't, haven't seen the movie, that's as much as I'm going to say. Because <laughs> the ending is fantastic. So I want to tell you about our own George Bailey moment. We here at Trinity do an absolutely fantastic job like George Bailey, of saying, it's out there, right? It's, in, it's at Feed My People. <laughs> it's at the Beacon House. It's in our food pantry. It's, it's, it's at Flynn Elementary School, right? If somebody says, hey, Trinity, you know, come up with your, you know, come up with the money right now, we can say, well, it's not here. It's out there. And yet, it is here. And that's what I want to share with you just for a moment. There's so much, and again, this is part of what It's a Wonderful Life is about. George was so busy looking out there that he very often forgot what the riches that he had right at home. The riches that he had. Donna Reed's character was just, she was so supportive and so helpful to George, and he often didn't see that. He had, uh, you, you might remember again if you've seen the movie, his, his youngest child, Zuzu, right? And she played that old rickety piano. <laughs> he doesn't realize it then, but it's an incredible gift to him and to his family. 
He doesn't realize how much is going on always right in his front yard. Because he's, he's given so much outside. So this is the time of year when I gotta ask you about the inside. Because I wanna point out some things that maybe we don't always notice that are happening right here. Your gifts make that organ possible. It's a tracker, which is organ parlance for difficult. We have to have the equivalent of Star Trek's Scotty to come and repair the organ, right? Surely I'm giving it all I can! <laughs> you know, I mean, it, trackers, they sound great, but they're very difficult to maintain. But your gifts make that possible. Bells are a lot easier. <laughs> Not as many moving parts. But still, your gifts make this happen. Sometime when you don't have a lot to do, boy, new microphones would be good. <laughs> or new ears, one or the other. One, yes, yeah, super glue, perfect. One of the staples, I was thinking. Next time you have a little bit of time, wander around Trinity and count the lights. <laughs> and not just the trees. <laughs> Count all the lights we have in the building. Your gifts make those happen so we can see. Right? You feel warm? Anybody, uh, everybody doing okay? Yeah. I get a copy of our bill from Excel every month. I'm glad we're warm. <laughs> but your gifts make that happen. Right? The Sunday school rooms, the curriculum that our Sunday school kids use, we think, wow, isn't it great that, that our kids are learning? Well, that happens with your gifts. That's how that happens. Inside. These carpets get, believe it or not, vacuumed and cleaned every week. <laughs> they have to because we've got a lot of feet. Right? You make that happen. Right? And I could go on and on and on. The bulletin that you're holding right now, you should see the paper we have. <laughs> While you're counting lights, stop by the room where we have all the office supplies. Holy cow. You make that happen. Because you see, what goes on inside, this is like the engine that makes everything happen outside. Right? You very rarely see your engine in your car. You just turn the key and it goes. And Trinity's a lot like that. We're lucky, we turn the key and it goes. But we continue to need your support to make that happen. If you listen to NPR like I do, you've heard all this last week. We need you to support, we're a member-driven organization. Now, I'm not gonna give you a coffee mug if you give it a certain level. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, we don't do that. But, but how does this fellowship sound? What does this have to do with Mary and Elizabeth? Mary and Elizabeth were able to do what they do because despite their worry, despite their nervousness, despite their confusion, and even despite all of the stuff that maybe we didn't hear them say, and even despite the fact that we know their future and they didn't, They said, here am I, send me, here am I, I will do what I can. And a 15-year-old girl who probably didn't have a penny to her name, given you know, where she lived and the time in which she did, a 15-year-old girl who didn't have a whole lot to offer materially, gave the only thing that she could give, and that was her consent. That was her willingness to say, Lord, if this is how you need me to be, then I'll do it. George Bailey, too. Trust. At the end of that scene, he had $2 left at the building and loan because he'd given it all away into the community. Given it all away. 
And he has a funny line that most people forget about. And he says, let's take these two and put them in the safe and see what happens. <laughs> Even then he had, you know, he had great trust and great hope. We've got our own little building and loan here. We've got a building, a big building, and a building that you, over the years, have put your blood, sweat, and tears into, and thank God you did. And we've also got a loan, because we share your gifts with the larger community in ways that make a difference in the building and out. But like Mary and like Elizabeth and like George, for us, it's all about trust. Do we trust God and do we trust each other? I think we do. And it's all because that baby grew up and he ministered and he showed us the way and he did what God asked him to do. He went to the cross for us died and rose again for us, paid the debt for us. And our response is to hear what he's called us to do. And that makes for a wonderful life. Amen. Thank you.